Hey everybody, my name is Josh Aftel, and I'm here with Andre LaRoe. We're gonna be talking about his photography and all things Adobe Lightroom and portfolio and, and, and. Oh, we're gonna talk about hair dye. Hair and, dye uh, and beard dye and... Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, and how, when, to, when to not wear black. When to not wear black. On the show is one of those times where not wear black. I think you're feasing it on the wall. That's okay, I'm just like, just like a, a balloting hat fair. head. I'm like the Cheshire cat of, of beard dye. Oh God. What's up, dude? How you been? Um, so it's the last day of Max. Um, it's been pretty good. I've gotten to meet some people whose work I really like, and I um, haven't really got to see the floor a lot, but we've been doing a lot of cool double exposures over Sweet. in the Yeah, booth. I saw that. That's been really yeah, fun. Yeah. That's cool. No, it's been, a, a, for me at least, been really, really wonderful to come out here and see all of the super, super creative talent. Uh, I love your work, and I love having a chance to chat with you and get to know you better. So it's cool that we have a chance to do this uh, Adobe Live thing, which is cool. So uh, what do you want to talk about? We're, we're going to talk about you, I think. I think we want to say like, what kind of work that you did that got you to be a creative resident at Adobe and so how you do we, that. we do anything else, I just want to say Josh is amazing. Um, one of the best things about being a resident is getting to meet all these people whose work directly impacts, has impacted my life for a long time. So I used to use Snapseed and you, that's your child. And it's I like mobile. Yep. I love it. I love my babies. Um, all these Adobe people did Photoshop, Lightroom. like. I use those every day, and without them, I would probably not be a photographer. Definitely. So, um, that's cool. And by the way, I got a little chat window. So for those of you at home, uh, yeah, they definitely got me with a spray gun. He got me. Uh, no, his face is not Photoshop. <laughs> it is that beautiful. Or are yes. you talking about mine? Yes, exactly. A living saturation slider. Exactly. Thank you, Hugo. Uh, but yeah, if you guys are chatting with us Just on Just now. It's on your team. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Uh, yeah, so what we're going to do is we're gonna, I'm going to be uh, checking out the chat window and if there's stuff that you want us to talk about or, or uh, mention, just make sure you, you chat in there. Uh, we'll totally be there for you guys and, and uh, work it into it somehow. But cool. Yeah. No, so totally from jump. The first thing I want to talk about is um, I'm in the residency program um, and we need to do our obligatory time where we, you know, big that up and talk about how awesome it is. So there's six residents total. Um, myself and Julia are two photographers. And you're not mic'd. <laughs> oh, whoa, I wasn't mic'd. I'm so sorry. You guys missed a lot of really bad jokes. No, no, we heard you. Oh, no, no, they heard them. Okay, well, good for you then. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, um, the way the program works is we have um, an entire year to work on some creative projects of ours. So the first thing people have been asking me is how did I find out about the program? Um, one of the program directors sent me an email during New York Fashion Week and just said, hey, the program exists and you should check it out. Um, I know they had a lot of people apply, I don't have the exact number, but basically the first thing I would say is if, if you apply, make sure you have like a well-rounded idea about something you wanted to do. Before I knew the residency, residency existed, I wanted to do two things. I wanted to do a portrait project about sunburns in the summer and like different parts of like beaches in America. Oh, and not just different parts of the body that's no, sunburned? No, no, no. Different, <laughs> there's a different beaches, so it would be a non-traditional portrait project where it's like an arm or a hand or a foot. Yeah. And I thought it'd be really kind of fun. Oh, I'd be great for that. I burn like crazy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, for all my melanin deficient friends <laughs> and sun and sunscreen deficient friends, that would work for you. And then I also want to do a project about um, plants from where that person, where that person's ethnicity is from, like from a long time. But both of those were kind of small. And when the opportunity presented itself, I wanted to do something really large. So I wanted to work on something that um, kind of tackled some things that are important to me. So I'm a photographer primarily, but I wanted to do a project that was immersive and kind of tackled the idea of making a complete portrait of someone. Um, and then the second thing I always tell people when they apply is try to frame your application through Adobe products. So Lightroom. For me, it was Lightroom, um, Audition, and Premiere. And you want to show that you have some ability to stretch and grow. I think my photography's gotten better this year, but I've also had to spend time with doing video and audio. I spent time with Josh learning some more stuff on Lightroom just so my workflow can be better. Um, and the idea is they want you to grow as a creative, but also like you're an ambassador for Adobe, so they want to know that um, you can have their best interests at heart. So that's one. Um, two, Julia's not going to be here, but she's a much better photographer than me, and she's German, so you guys should check her, check it out. Um, <laughs> does, does that the, the fact that she's German like does that add to her photography skills? Or in, a, in a way, <laughs> in a way, because sometimes it's different, right? It's a different different culture, different approach, and it's a different, different way of looking approach. at things. And that's what's really great about photography mm -hmm. is that everybody has a chance to bring their own like background upbringing into the, the mix. And then when somebody's from a totally different viewpoint, and that's actually what makes me so excited about photography today is the fact that there are so many people out there that can now be photographers and bring their own style into it. But sorry, you were going on with point number two. Oh, there's nothing to apologize for. Look, thanks to the internet, every day more people are getting the opportunity to be um, 
immersed in their creativity. Yeah. That's awesome. Right now, I don't even know you guys, and we're talking. Right. I, because of the internet, I met Josh. Think about Woo. that. It's madness. High five, bro. So, um, I just want you guys to know the residency is important. Apply to it, and just get in the pro get in the habit of writing your ideas out, um, and just trying to seeing how far you can work on them. Um, some of the past residents check their workout. It's great. I don't want to be the only person that talks about it, but I just want you guys to know how important it is. You should check it out. It's awesome. Um, so the second thing is, I think I'm going to show you guys a little bit of some stuff I've been working on. Let's um, check it out. Are they clicked into my? I don't know. We, I'm, I'm sure that they will be. We're, okay. We're be switching over to your. We can see it here. Yes. Good. Oh, that, I can I can bend backwards and then I see things. Good. Oh. I got it. <laughs> okay. So this week, if you guys were on the um on the first of all, we're in Lightroom CC, the new Lightroom CC. The we had some champagne. We pop it off <laughs> in excitement. <laughs> this new product. Um, that's getting really freaking cool every day. Um, upcoming, we have all these great features. The number one one I'm excited about is working with you to figure out how we get filters to sync, and then we can do cool rainbow filters where everyone can look like this like, like all the name, time. Yeah. But in actuality, um, we all like, like how we edit, and um, I'm gonna show you guys a couple of portraits. I'm gonna stop with my friend Karen first. So my project's called Stories From Here, and the idea is to meet people in their spaces and tell the stories of how they got there, so it's how your sense of place internally in your local area, and then in America in general, kind of frames how you think about yourself. How do I get one of those uh, rainbow neon lights? I actually, I will introduce you, and yes. you guys will be best friends. Yes. So if you guys notice, first of all, we slide over. Um, the way they reorganize it now is you see the light channel. Um, it does all the things that it normally does, but as you work with your presets, it's a little more responsive. So you can see what you're doing and how you're working on it. And you can kind of get a, this is a better way for you to learn how all these things work. It's like getting immediate feedback. It's like, hand on stove, burn hand, bad. It's just like the equivalent of me being like, oh, what if this was just super bright? Oh, whoa, look, look how cool that is. No, that looks super bad. Um, oh, God, I got to send this back. So anyway, um, I just want to give you guys a little look into this um, and how it works and stuff. Um, and then I wanted to give you guys a little taste of my project. But first, I was just going to kind of show you a couple portraits. Let's get these a little bigger in here. So that's what I like to do. The, the, the view modes are pretty sweet in here. You can do like the kind of tidy tuck away. So here's a couple of portraits that I've already unveiled on my site, which I've done through Adobe Portfolio. And if you have Creative Cloud, don't buy another website, just use this. I didn't know it existed. Yeah, portfolio I think it's great. awesome. And it also integrates directly with Lightroom. So all of your yes. photos that are inside of Lightroom, you yep. can actually pull them right into Portfolio. And Behance. And Behance, and it makes it super, super easy. <laughs> I've, joined the, I've joined Skynet, I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, if you, I'm just going to give you guys a quick tour through some of the images. Um, these are some portraits I took when I was in Los Angeles. I have a couple of specific people talking about what brought them there. Right. Um, Tashina, for example, shoot, she is a wedding dress. Oh, sorry guys. She's a wedding dress maker. So I had uh, her show me some of her shears so I could shoot through it. Um, and th this project I really enjoyed because it was a nice mix of this heavy white um, and something obscuring the lens with this nice mix of color, which is a really good framing of um, her as a dressmaker. And she talks about how Los Angeles is a city of dreams in many ways. And you don't have to grow up. You really can just pursue your dream repeatedly and rub stuff together until you get to that point. Um, and I think that's, that's why I wanted to do this project was kind of framing how people think about things and kind of understanding better what it means to be an adult. Like we spend all this time um, in school and we graduate and then we're expected to kind of just grow up rapidly um, but we, we're lacking a mix of perspectives. It's not only that, it's not only growing up, but in some ways some people think that growing up means giving up your dreams and giving up the things that are that are exciting to you and, and you have to like take those things that you thought were really great, you got to put them aside, you got to take like a real job and then suddenly go out there and no offense to real jobs out there, but not everybody wants to have one of those jobs. I don't think there's a thing as a real or a fake job. What was the first job you ever had? Uh, I made, um, well, the first like job where I actually worked for somebody else, I used to live in Israel and I worked in a falafel shop. So that was my first job was like making falafel and I ate so much falafel, uh, it, it, I just, I haven't even been able to eat falafel ever since then and that was like 25, 26 years ago. It's been, a, that was a lot of falafel. I mean when you have a machine that you turn on and it just drops the falafel right into the deep fryer and you can pull it right out and pop it in your mouth, you will go as hog wild as I went. So that was, it was some pretty good stuff. But that was my first job. Oh, I don't think that I would really want to ever be the falafel boy again, but it was a good, a good experience. I think what's nice about now, is especially with CC, and just everything in general, even if my job is whatever it is, I can still like be creative on my weekdays and weekends. Right. I can work on all this different stuff. I can share this stuff kind of easily. I'm gonna slide over and show you guys, oh, sorry. 
and show you guys what my site looks like actually. And then give you a little taste in Adobe Portfolio because I feel like they don't get enough love yeah. and Josh is here. So yeah, like I said, it's called Stories From Here. Uh, it's a visual study how our sense of place impacts us. Um, so the stories kind of populate here. My favorite thing right now that I just learned is how to do overlays so these mm. GIFs move. Right. So you can kind of get a nice little sense of the person as you get a preview. Well, that's really cool. Um, and then on and top of that, those gifts? Um, just through Photoshop, right? um, doing import video So layers. you have a video and then you like, that'd be cool to see how you do that. Yeah, maybe. we can actually me. do that. Yeah, like, why don't you show us how you did that? Because that is pretty cool. Totally. Here, uh, we already looked at Karen, so we'll show you. So some descriptions of them, mm -hmm. portrait, little intro. And you guys can see, um, I'm going to turn this audio off because I don't know where it's going to run through. Yeah. But basically it runs and I'm using uh, Premiere so that you can, uh, you can slow the frames down with optical flow. And so you can kind of get a sense of what this person's mannerisms are like as they move mm -hmm. and act. Um, so it, it kind of runs and reads kind of like a short magazine piece. Audio you can integrate and... and this is all done through portfolio. All done through portfolio, which I was surprised by and thrilled about. So yeah, that's the end of it. And the whole point of it is where, where they're from and where they live now. Sweet. So let's, uh, let's actually make a GIF. I'm super down. Yeah, it's fun. So, uh, as you guys know, like you can't just make massive gifts because then they won't go anywhere. Oh, and actually, while we have this open, you can see what some of the double exposures look like. Sweet. So, when you're making gifts in Photoshop CC, you go to File, Import, Video Frames from Layers, and you want to do this without a, uh, without a new file open because it's just a completely different workflow than your normal Photoshop file. So, uh, gotta wait. And you still haven't done the double exposure of me. Why not? So, Josh has been really busy. Eating pizza and... I haven't had pizza. <laughs> Whatever it is that you do. Um, <laughs> here, we'll... Uh, I we'll, want a double exposure. They're we'll cool. totally do one later today. Good. Uh, we'll go to the rotated video folder and see what's in here. Um, here, we'll do one of Bonnie that I love. This is my friend Bonnie. Or now it's my friend. It's a subject I had. Forgive me, my computer is slow because I'm running a bajillion things on it. But... Um, by the way, people are making fun of you for having a lot of stuff on your desktop. Okay, so just so we're clear, I lent this computer to another <laughs> resident, and this is what she did. My, my desktop does not look like this. You can tell because, honestly, if you go over to my, my flat screen, these first three things are mine. I don't even know what this stuff is. Hold on. Let's just be clear. Images of presentation? Come on, Natalie. Does that look like me? Does that look like Natalie Blue? Yo, I'm gonna drag her later. I'm just kidding. So now we're in more video frames from layers. And if you guys can see, it'll show you what the video looks like. Oh, so just like in Premiere, you can set the edges of the video. So you see what the video looks like, and then these two sliders on the left and the right will show how much you're gonna import. So now let's say you're importing something and like a lot of GIFs that you use on your phone or anything, right. you can't be like, like 30 megabytes because then it's not going to go into Giphy or whatever. Yeah. So one thing you can do is you want to just go ahead and find the motion that you like. So let's say I want to have her emerging out, which starts about here, but I don't want her to swim all the way through. I want to just go ahead and scrub back to maybe here. Now, even with that, that might still be a large enough file. So you can do this thing where you write limit to however many frames. Mm. And what it'll do instead of just importing like, so a video is really just like 30, 60, 120 frames a second, right? And even if this is 12 seconds, 120 times 12 is more than you want. So let's say let's limit it to nine frames a second. So we'll hit play, and now you're seeing nothing but blacks. So you're like, what is this? You go to window, and you add timeline. And then down here, you can see all of your frames together. And when it plays, it'll be kind of choppy. Because like a GIF. Like That's a great. GIF. But let's say you're not sure how smooth you want it to be. You can go down here, oh, select all these frames, and in this tiny little arrow, you can change how much delay there is. So for me, I think it looks a little choppier, a little smoother at 0.3 seconds. So I'll hit that, and then you go ahead and play through. So it's a little slower, but when you load it onto Portfolio, it moves the pace I want. But if I want it to look more realistic, I will change it so that there's no delay. So at no delay, it'll play just like a video you're used to. That's cool. Yeah, so that's how you make it. Yep. And, and then, then how do you save it out? You save it out. Um, so since if size is important, you go to File, and you go to Export, Save for Web slash Legacy, which I always think sounds kind of badass. 
I don't know what legacy it is. It was the legacy Safer Web. Next okay. Yeah, so so I was like, there used to be a thing called Safer Web, and I think that that's what they're referring to. Because ah. now there's the old, there's a new export mechanism, which is the Command Shift Option oh, W, there it is. which now is we're the not new export one. And just like they call that the claw, because you have to make a claw in order to do it. Like, uh, but yeah, that's the that's the old <laughs> way of saving this out, and there's the new way of saving. Josh it out. is giving me many many pieces of information that I, as a young young buck, was unaware of. So yeah, if, if you look over here, you can see the size of the GIF, and that's important depending on what, where you're going to import it, as well as the width and the height. But then when you can hit play over here too to just make sure it's at the, the speed that you want. If it's too big, you can change the amount of colors in it. But if you change the colors, it'll degrade the GIF, as you guys know. But if you're using it on your phone, it's not going to matter that much. Yeah. And you go and it's ahead also and save. a smaller file anyway. Yeah. Right? And then it saves through whatever you want, just like normal. So hit save. And I think somebody was mentioning like making the uh, much smaller GIF is important because it's important to have like the file not take forever when you yes. load it up, and especially mm -hmm. if, if you're going to be having people. It depends on, on where your viewers are. Yeah. If you have a lot of viewers in places where the internet isn't very fast, mm -hmm. you want to make sure that the file is not too large because otherwise it's going to be a really painful experience. And that's why on my on portfolio, these actually limit to the size of I think 1.4 megabytes, right? Which is like a floppy disk, maybe. Right. I don't even know if it's that. What, so, do you know what a floppy disk is? I do. I had a floppy disk. Um, I had one when I was young kid, like six, nice. I remember. So yeah, um, so this is some of the project, and then quick look in the portfolio. Um, the, my favorite thing about it right now is you can have these global page styles. Right. So if you notice, all the pages are set the same, and you guys know I did not spend, or you know I didn't spend days just laying this out the same way. Right. So you it have your different, yeah, your, your different font templates. You still have to arrange things, right. but a similar style works, and if you notice, this feeds right from Behance, Exactly. So like you can pull stuff from Behance. Yeah, if you, you have can, images you can, in Behance already, pull it right you in. Can pull right in. You can pull your whole post into Behance. So if right. you look at Karen's, even though I don't have the same fonts, it's it's the similar layout. And then when you go into Portfolio, you can go into Manage Content, click on this gear, and you can update on Behance, or you can re-import. Right. So re-import will reset it, or you can update where you, instead of pulling from Behance, right. you're pushing to Behance. Yeah, and, uh, and you also have, uh, there's a new thing that we added in here, which was the ability to import from Lightroom. Yes. And that's also yes. really cool. Like, if you're using Lightroom CC, and your See images this, are already up so on this integrations, Lightroom. you can just go ahead and add albums. Right. Um, and then I didn't ha add any albums, because all of mine are a little disorganized at the moment, despite your jokes about my, uh, my desktop. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so... Well, real quick, before we go on, uh, yep. there was a question from Miles. He wanted to know how many GIFs you have in your project. Um, like one per, like... Almost one per person. So I think I've done 50 interviews so far. I have about 20 interviews up on this site. I think only two don't have GIFs. And it just depends if people don't want their video taken. Like, um... Were there, did you have that? I mean, Yeah, yeah, this, this guy right here, um, he, he really loved his baby daughter. He's an um, ex-Air Force guy, and he just, he didn't really want to, he was like skittish on getting his photo taken. Right. So we, we made a compromise. I'll take a couple photos, but I'll give them to you, of you and your daughter, and then we won't have to do any, right. um, any gifts. Cool. And there was another person that had a question before we move on that was asking um, how you got your inspiration to be both a photographer and uh, actually the question specifically was how did you discover your passion for writing and photography? Um, so I was a journalism major in college, but when I was in high school, um, my theater teacher gave me a film camera when I was 15. He had this old Minolta that he uh, he's had forever, and I remember it had a huge dent right in the um, the prism yeah. because he dropped it down some stairs in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And I think I think for some reason I had like a disposable camera on a trip like when I was like 13, and he saw it and he just gave it to me as a gift. Um, and it's always meant a lot to me. I never, I haven't really gotten to speak to him, speak to him because after we graduated, he actually died. Oh, that sucks. And it, no, it was it was rough, but um, it's just funny like how something so innocuous can change a lot of things. That's oh, amazing, isn't so, it? Like, just like, yeah. that, it sets you up and it's like that pathway that just suddenly opens up all these doorways. And yeah. A lot of times we talk to people that, that they didn't even know they were going to go down that pathway of no. becoming a photographer. They had all these other inspirations and goals. I, I had the complete opposite. I was expecting to be a photographer and now I'm a product manager at Adobe, so it's complete opposite. But <laughs> yeah, but think about it. Your reach of influence. Think about, think about this. You're going to hate this, but uh -oh. Josh is like, this is bottles, just sprays of water, and then it continues to flow over. Like, everyone I know has worked, has used tools that you work on. And at the end of the day, like, I might inspire three people. You've allowed 
about. Oh, this is not about people. me. This is about you. No, I'm just saying, and that that's what kind of makes this whole Adobe thing really fun. Right. Um, and just like um, my old teacher did, so I used to shoot with one of my friends, Katie, in high school, and my friend Jeff, and we just kind of mess around. And then I was a big MySpace blogger. Nice. <laughs> I don't really like to tell people that. <laughs> and it came out of my mouth, and I was like, "Why am I saying this?" No, it's okay. It's I'm okay. so sorry. I deleted my MySpace. Or after um, was it like? Timberland, like, was it? The, who bought it? Justin? No, 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 this is way before way that. Way before that, okay. I was like, this is like 2003. Yeah. Uh, I don't know when Timberland Blake bought it, but I stopped using it. Anyway, um, <laughs> and then. So did you did you know, um, was his face Mike from MySpace? Was that his name? Was his name? Tom. Tom from I did MySpace. Not know him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forgot But yeah, name. I mean, I was always take photos and I really liked it. Yeah. And then it just one of those things where it kept happening and I needed to not be poor and like right. destitute. Right, right. So I just kept using the skill I had and then. People were really kind enough to give me good opportunities. Like, I last year I got, or early this year I got to shoot the NCAA tournament in Madison Square Garden. I love basketball more than anything. Really? So more than anything? Not anything, but more than a lot of things that I'm willing to name. I see. Um, I hope that right now someone is editing on a list of things. Like, do you watch Parks and Rec? Yeah, not for a while. Okay, I watched it at one point, but I don't. So you want you want there to be like a, it's a an ongoing thing. list of just. What things that you love more than basketball, or things that you love basketball more, more than? More than. Uh, okay, so like puppies. Yes, like I don't really sunrises. care about that's like sunrises. Is no ice cream cones. Ice cream, yeah, I love basketball and that. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's good. Do you? What do you love? What do I love? I love photography. Okay. Uh, food, travel, uh, puppies. We really love puppies. Um, my girlfriend, of course. Yes. Yes. We all love Josh's girlfriend. Yeah, she's wonderful. And who else? Like, there's lots of things that I love. People are going to give us trouble now. Oh, man. Is there any other questions people want? Yeah, there's lots of questions. Yeah, let's, um, let's toss them in. So let's see here. Um, oh, somebody's like asking, GIF or, G oh, GIF GIF or oh, GIF. GIF? Yes, yes, it's GIF. You, I don't, I GIF, don't know. definitely. It's not, it's not peanut butter. It's, I it's GIF. I don't know. I just, I just said it how I thought it was pronounced. And you did a good but job. But I didn't realize that there was like a lot of... Oh, there's a, there's a big fight out there. I think that there are, there are people out there that will, uh, that will fight you. They would like, fight like bare knuckle boxing. Yeah, exactly. No, they just get on a switchblade. Like, don't dare you say it that way. <laughs> okay, no switchblade. We no are switch anti switchblade yes, in exactly. the Adobe Creative Residency. Exactly. Exactly. So cool. Oh, some Miles has a poodle. So apparently Miles loves uh, his Ooh. poodle. That's good. Deborah, I did go to a Florida school. I went to the University of Florida, and I'm from Fort Lauderdale, actually. Really? Fort Lauderdale. Sunny, sunny Fort Lauderdale with great beaches. So let's let's talk more about some of your photography. Uh, what did you do before this um, this project? What, what was your work that you were working on before your stories from here? Okay, so before stories from here. Oh whoa! Instagram uh, web just changed. It looks different than like yesterday because they didn't have ago? this slide over. Um, before stories from here, let's scroll down a little bit. Um, or I'll show you guys some like bad stuff I've been trying to mess with recently. I like bad stuff. So really quick stories from here has been awesome. Like I've gotten to do that. I also have been working on a train project. Um, Good morning, Andre. I've been working on a train project about. So I live in Brooklyn, and the G train is changing rapidly. And how? Because I haven't seen. I don't think I've ever been on the G train. How? Really? How has it changed from what? Okay, to what? so the G train used to only be four train cars. Okay. Every train except the G in New York, minus the shuttles, which don't fully count, is an eight train car. So it full, fills the entire station. The G train is only four trains, or four train cars because it generally serves an, uh, an area with less people. Mm -hmm. um, people call it the ghost train, people kind of joke around about how big it is and long it is, but since a lot of the areas where the G train is has experienced like a huge population boom, mm -hmm. they have all of a sudden have all of these people on the train now. So, it's just so generally each train, the MTA statistic says that each train grows in ridership about 2.6% a year, the G train's almost at 10, okay. which is quadruple-ish, almost well, five times the amount, yeah. which is insane. So I started doing this project called Headed to Church Ave. Um, so we have, a, we have three projects in our residency. I have stories from here, this, and then I have a story called Please Don't Nikes in the Pool, which I didn't start yet. But Headed to Church Ave is a street photography project about the people on the G-Train and what all the stops are like. Um, and my goal this year is to make a lot of projects that are wrapped around sense of place. So um, I shot these with my trusty little Fuji. Um, and these are just all images that run through of just like life on the train. Um, and I want to document it because right now, not only is it experiencing this huge boom, mm -hmm. but also the L is about to close. So for the next year or two years, um, the G is going to experience a 150 to 200 percent increase in ridership. So they're right. doubling the train cars. They're adding more trains. So all of a sudden, we have all these people on the train, and it's like kind of this fun, interesting thing. Because the very last thing about the G is it's like it's like the Josh of trains. It is the only one that doesn't go to Manhattan. 
and it serves a certain area of people that right. are quirky and it's fun and it's like really awesome. Um, so we have that, and then let's pop through. I'll show it's you guys. Like, a lot of these things just sort of reminded me of Bruce Davidson's uh, series. Did you ever see Bruce Davidson's series from back in the day? I did, but I want you to show me right now. You want me to show you? Okay, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Bruce Davidson. So before the residency, I got to work on some holy photos. Holy, like not like I'm holy, but holy like the festival. So I took this photo that I love a lot um, and just kind of worked with color. And I've been working on a lot of ways to um, use texture and images and kind of have a level of dynamic range. So right. whenever I talk about mobile photography with people, I always say that until you figure out, A, how to create depth, so whether that's with light or whether that's with some kind of like levels of image, because that's what makes a cinematic that's what makes a film a film. Right. Because um, if not, everything is flat. But if you think about the films that are really powerful, you have a sense of um, dynamicism to the images. So I've been trying to play with texture and really like figure out how to kind of give things more, more depth to them. So even this image I took from this thing called Cameras and Dancers, um, you're running up and you're starting blurred and you're running back. So you really only have like a certain area of depth but the image has multiple layers to it. Right. So um, you're saying have a foreground, midground, background. Yeah, or just light your image separately and differently. It has some um, dimensionality to it. This is one of my photos I took at the um, NCAA tournament, and it was awesome. Even though I actually shot a game where my alma mater played and lost, but this is one of my favorite photos I've taken, so I'll oh, get nice. over it. Um, and then, yeah, I got to shoot Fashion Week, which was super fun. It's as intense as it sounds, but I definitely advise you guys going to it if you've never done it before. Right. It's one of, if you ever want to do street style photography, this is the place to try it out because everyone wants to get their photo taken. And a half of street style is just being comfortable enough to run up on people and take their images. Right. Um, and you can just capture the best parts of humanity like that. Austin, by the way, sorry, Austin, I disagree with you. And I don't care what Gizmodo says, and I don't care what the creator of the GIF says. Oh. He is wrong. Oh. Just straight up wrong. Listen. Austin, you seem like a nice guy. His hair is dyed. <laughs> you see how intense the student is? Like, I can't imagine. I just, it doesn't even. <laughs> Josh is not like a half measure kind of person. <laughs> like, does that make sense? So, um, but yeah, if you have any more questions, yeah, ask there, there's me a bunch of more questions. Josh. So, like, some of the questions are right now uh, Do you ask before or after taking the photo when you were doing the photos on the G train? Oh, on the G train. I don't ask anybody anything on the G train. Which is rough for me, personally. There are times people will get upset or it's kind of weird. But honestly, um, the train is, for me, the, the first thing that got difficult is the train is a really compact area. And usually with street photography, you can kind of run up, take the photo, and kind of disappear. But you're on the train, you're... <laughs> Ninja you, photography. You're, you know, I mean, like, not even in that way, but like you, you, you stand in a place, you watch, you wait, you watch a moment kind of build, and then you kind of make your way toward it as yeah. you feel like it's going to hit a climax. Right. Whether that's like kids playing... Um, well, one of the things that I found, when you're, when you're taking street photography, I take photos, then after I've taken the photo, I usually will approach the subject, let them know what I took a picture of, why I was taking the picture, so they don't feel like that I'm just trying to like take advantage of them or in some ways, or, or repurpose their, their likeness. Yeah, because uh, you know. people don't want to do that, and no. I completely agree with it. But it's also like if you ask somebody before, some people, not everybody, but some people will freeze up, they'll yeah. pose, and you, you don't want that. You can't ask before. I, so I'm just not a fan of it. I don't, I don't also don't ask before, but I, before I reuse something, I will ask permission. Oh, for sure. So the reason why it's different for me here is on the train, every stop, people are getting up and leaving. So a lot of the times, I don't have that luxury. Sometimes I'll talk to people, sometimes I won't. Um, sometimes a kind of a scene will develop. Like one of my favorite scenes on the train this year was um, I decided I wanted to ride it at night um, on the weekend and see if I right. found anything weird. And I, it was kind of a fruitless journey. I'd ridden the train about four times back and forth right. in the end. And it's not a long train, it's about an hour each right. way. So you just kind of whatever. Yeah, and a good feeling for I it. get on the train and I'm like, all right, like I switch the car, I'm ready to go home. And I just start hearing like this group of people singing. So these people had left church and they were just decided to keep singing on the they train. Stop. And it was like six people just beautifully harmonizing yeah. and like a little girl with them. And so each stop we got on, people kept getting on, being surprised, and then singing along with them. Oh, wow. And it was this really beautiful scene um, where like we had a moment where they acknowledged that I was taking photos and we kept going and you know everybody was happy with it. So I just think it depends on the person and the situation. A lot of times on the train I'll take a photo and then they're off before I can say anything or do right. anything. And the number one thing that's good about the train is like I have a tendency to want to wait and not like mess a moment up. But at any moment everything can change. Like people are gonna get in and out, 
like with the stop, we might get stuck. So like I have to take a photo and kind of move on. Yeah. Um, and that way it kind of forces me into a, just a habit of being like, okay, photo, go. Right. So I can talk to them, I can, and if not, you yeah. know? Cool. Um, and I think the one thing that does help me is it is New York, so I think people are used to being inundated with just people. They're New York like, I don't things. care, whatever, whatever. Yeah. Get out. So, so um, there was another question out here. People were asking, uh, how much enhancement do you do to your images? And maybe it'd be good if you could walk us through editing one of your photos. Oh. Do you have a photo that maybe you can show us how like a typical editing session might go for you, the kinds of tools that you like to edit, the kind of effects that you like to apply to your images? Um, here, let's add a new photo. Cool. Let's see if we can get in here. We're gonna go into like, uh, let's go get something completely not even and while you're pulling that up, somebody else was asking what cameras are mostly used in street photography, and I, I think the answer today is iPhones. Yeah, uh, iPhones because <laughs> if you're if you're like like a rough person and you really hate talking to people, you can take a photo with your headphone. Yeah. Um, or I would suggest getting a mirrorless um, and using a camera that has a silent shutter. Yeah. Um, you can use a Sony. You can use Fuji. I have a Fuji X yeah. uh, 100F, and it's really nice because the shutter, the shutter silent, and if a lot's going on, I can actually remote release from my phone, so I can set things That's up helpful. and shoot. Um, if it's like a kind of a tender moment, and you don't want to ruin it. Another another kind of camera that's really nice is when they have the articulating screen, so you can do it at the waist level. So you can bring the screen out and you can hold it down. That way, a lot of times when you bring the camera up to your eye, people get like frozen. They can see that. Oh yeah, yeah. They're, they're down, like, what is going on? You can be serendipitous about your, your photography and just take a picture. And then of course, again, we don't want to like take advantage of people. We want to go and show them, hey, I was taking your photo because I'm working on this project, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, really, I think a lot of times when you share with people the fact that you saw something really magical about them, or something that you liked about them, people love the oh, compliments. They do. They're just like, I just love the light that you had. I love this expression. I love the way that you were talking to your friend, whatever that might be. Yeah, no, people people love being um, being encouraged. Like, I mean, think about it. For someone to say you're beautiful enough that I just wanted to stop and take an image. Almost there, guys. Just want to get the. I have an image in mind that I want to edit for you. Just gotta find it. Meanwhile, though, I hope everyone's having fun. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, um, Miriam has asked a couple of times uh, to talk more about the creative residency. I guess she joined later after we had already talked about that. But okay. maybe some folks that have joined later would like to hear a little bit more while you're picking up a photo. Talk a little bit more about the creative residency. What does it mean for you? What kind of support do you get from it? And then we'll switch back over to editing this photo. So creative residency. Um, applications come out in January. Um, it's not like a particularly long application, but yeah. I was kind of mentioning earlier that one of the best things that you want to do is spend some time and write like an actual business proposal. Mm -hmm. Like this is also, you shed a single green beard hair. I know, I do that I all never, the time. I've never seen that Yeah, I, I shed like all kinds of hairs. Like my girlfriend gets so mad at me because they'll be like, People usually complain about their girlfriends shedding hair everywhere. I shed hair and it not only is it colorful, but sometimes it even stains things. So like, <laughs> what can I do? I mean, you know what? I suffer for my art just like other people suffer for theirs. Um, so, <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I, um, oh, so I think you should just get used to writing a business proposal. So. Um, you want to think about your project. So the way I framed my project was, I said, I talked about like um, a couple years ago sitting in my room, watching the Ferguson riots and seeing a lot of my friends feel like they didn't understand what was happening. And I, I, remember, I think one of the biggest things I've kind of felt as an adult is feeling a sense of displacement in America, not really understanding like, I don't feel like I don't understand my neighbor as well. Mm. So I wanted to make a project where I was forcing myself to listen and capture folks that have stories that are unique not because they're ex they're ex they're particularly like extraordinary people, but just in the banalness of everyday stuff. Like we grow up, you know, some bad things happen, some good things happen, and that shapes how we value things. And then we move to a place, and we're impacted by how that place's geography is. And then you know we vote for someone, or like all these things kind of go into how we think and we feel. Um, and so I wrote a proposal about wanting to do projects that are about how our sense of place impacts right. us, which is a nice way of like. Hey, I'm working on stuff, but I also am not like, this is the most political thing of all time. Right. So um, first do that. Second, frame it around um, 
Adobe products so that there is clear business tie. Right. So I'm going to use Lightroom to do this. I would love to learn Premiere to do this, um, Audition or Muse right. or Illustrator, which I don't use, but just as an example. Um, and then for the residency, there's six of us. There's two German residents and four American. Um, feel free to check our workout, um, especially other people. It's me and five really talented women, um, girl gang. And, you know, we, we basically work, we live where we work. Um, and then we have weekly check-ins yep. and then monthly project reviews and then presentations to Adobe staff. Yep. And we work with the product teams to kind of help learn new products. Like I got to do some Nimbus stuff early. Oh, I'm so sorry, CC stuff early. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> um, and then we also have some like speaking engagements and some specific things to show our work. But basically it forces you into that adulthood that you may not right. have now. Like right now a lot of us live on the internet. We get tweets and comments and likes and favorites from our friends. Um, and maybe some other people we like will see it, but there's a level of accountability that we have now that's really great. If that right. makes sense. Yeah, and, and I guess one is other there an question. Age restriction? I don't know. Yeah, I no. don't think so. I think it's about where you are in your career. I don't think it's an age restriction. Yeah. Um, the or youngest one of us is 21, and the oldest one I think is 29 or 30. I'm not sure either. But and what other? I mean, so you're saying that you get these weekly check-ins. Do you get anything else? And obviously, you get software. We get software. Um, we they try to help us find some brand partners. Um, I know Jessica's with Logitech. Mm -hmm. Chelsea doing stuff with HP um, and you basically just work to try and like the thing they told us in the interviews was they're trying to get us to grow in three years worth in one mm -hmm. um, and then yeah we present stuff in NNU, we present stuff in Max, nice. we go to South by like things like that. Okay um, and let's see here so now that we've answered that question let's go back to editing this uh, photo. Let's talk about like how we're gonna watch you live edit mm -hmm. a photo talk through like the tools that you use yeah. and why you do those things. Because I think the, the question specifically was, what kind of enhancements do you normally do? How enhanced do you make your images? Because a lot of people were saying that they really love your style. They really love the, the look of your images. Mm -hmm. And it, it, this is a straight out of camera that we're yeah, looking at right a, now? Yeah, this is the raw that we're looking at right now. So um, this is an example. I interviewed this woman in New Haven, Connecticut. Her name's Lauren Larson. She's an amazing wedding photographer whose work I've loved for a long time. And interviewing her, learning about growing up in Texas, and. Um, you know, how that framed how she thinks about herself and now how she's passing those feelings about like personal care and love uh, to her daughter is really awesome. So I wanted to take a tender image that really showed how much she loves her. So I sat her down next to this kind of strong window. And you don't notice the first thing here, oh, is that Eleanor, her daughter, is a little brighter than I'd like. So the first thing I want to do generally is I always kind of set my shadows and I'll move these down a little bit just because, oh, sorry. Just because I want to see, I want there to be some depth. But also with Eleanor, like, it's so bright here. This highlight is crazy. If you move it up anymore, you see how much it gets blown out. So you want to bring it down a little bit. And then with that, now I have the ability to kind of play with my exposure a little bit and bring some things up. Because now that highlight isn't as insane and everything's a little flatter, which is not generally something I want to do, but if I start from a flat point, then I can work around that. So you're basically, you're, right now, the first thing you do is you balance the tonality yeah. in the image. Yeah. Oh, let's, uh, let's get this um, histogram out. Oh, sorry. Where did it go? I forget how to turn this on. Remember how to turn the histogram on? Is it a command zero? I don't oh. remember. Yeah. There we go. So you can see um, how the light fits, uh, sits over there. Uh, the whites I'm going to bring down too because this is a stark white. Um, and then from there, I would honestly start with my clarity because um, I think right here it's really soft and tender, but I want to have a little bit of punch around the edges. And so what Clarity is doing is it's going in and it's trying to extract some of the extra texture and detail in the image. It's playing around with mid-tone contrast. It's a pretty unique uh, algorithm that we came up with a while back or already. I don't know how long ago it was, but it's been there for a little bit. But it's really, really popular because of that ability to add more depth to the image, especially working on smaller details in the image. It's, some people think of it like sharpening, a lot of people think about like contrast, and it's somewhere between contrast and sharpening. It's not so much sharpening, sharpening because sharpening um, would give us all Con like... Conceptually, it's very similar to sharpening, oh. but like, yeah, like the, you can think about it like what all sharpening is doing is it's on very small details, increasing the contrast between one object to the next. Con like clarity is working on a larger level yeah. of things, so it's adding contrast at a larger level, but locally. Whereas like contrast is doing things globally. So they have like, you can think about contrast, clarity, sharpening, all in a very similar family of yeah. image processing of approaches, but doing it with different in intentions. And, and that's why it's like, you're right in saying that it's not sharpening because sharpening, you're gonna try and 
create that small details and make it look like it's in focus if it's not in focus. But conceptually, they're they're they're, so they're cousins. They're cousins. Okay. Yeah. I mean. It is true because you notice uh, it adds a little detail to her hair right here. And I actually like this image a lot. I remember later she was like, I think my hair is a little messy. And I'm like, I think it's very accurate. Like, you're a mom. You have stuff you got to do. Yep. Um, and then from there, this little, I mean, it's it's crooked because of how I shot it. But I would like to kind of give it a little straightening um, so that we're working from here. And then, you know, we're, let's, we're talking about the contrast. So let's bump that up a little tiny bit to give it like this ethereal thing. So now you'll see it's similar. It's kind of back to where we were highlight wise. But um, there's enough contrast for it to have like this weight to it. And I think that the most important part of the image is how she's holding her hand here. So, um, healing brush we don't need. Oh, <laughs> I forgot to turn those off. Um, but. You got it? <laughs> no, I got it now. Um, Dude, you gotta use the two finger swipe to make that bigger and smaller. Oh, whoa. I've, I've just always used these. No, 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 no. What are you talking about? Woo. Whoa. Look at that. Bad. So much easier. Two, Two finger swipe. swipe. And if I you're not bad. using a trackpad, use a mouse wheel. So much faster. Whoa. Okay. I know. Amazing. So all I was going to do was add a little sharpness and brightness, not to this degree, down to her hand. Because this is that tender moment I'm talking about. So you can see how it's working. Um, I got to make sure it's even. And then when you pull up, actually, when you click on this, I actually like being able to see, oh, Mask. You see the mask where it is, so I can see how serious it is. Um, and then I can also turn it down a little bit, which is good. Cool. So I'm going to work on there. Oh. Uh, Karen, I'm not sure. I don't think that works on a Surface Book screen, but I haven't actually used a Surface Book ever, so I don't know. Karen, I'm sorry. We're, we're unsure, but we'll find out. Um, and then you guys were talking about presets. There are a bunch of these presets. I'm a big, like, Visco totally rad person, but we have all these new ones um, in Adobe that kind of help you run through things. So high contrast, vivid. So let, let, but before we go through the presets, let's mm -hmm. just like, hold on, let's just make sure. So what you've done is you've balanced the tonality. You've then identified the areas that you want to like bring focus on. Like you said, those tender moments. You use the selective tools to draw attention to some of those areas. Um, do you do any other kind of creative enhancements on top of it? Do you ever do anything like with curves or split toning? Or? Curves and split toning, I do do. It just depends on um, it depends on the image. So this image, there's not a ton of distracting color. Right. Um, so let's say I'm shooting something and I want to split tone. Um, well, you can't. Un unfortunately, like you don't have split toning yet in here. And no, so I know. What I do when I'm working on Lightroom CC and I want to get curves or split toning, I'll just fire it up on my iPad or my Android device or my iPhone. I have all of these things. Yeah, you uh, have. I have a lot of devices. Trap yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're, they're my burner phones. Uh, and you can like go in there and you can use the curves on them. And because everything's synchronized in the ecosystem, It's you can get it. Of course, the curves and split are coming really soon to Lightroom CC. But the reason I was asking about that is because those are tools that are often used to add, like once you get your image to this point, you've got the tonality, you've got the depth, you've got everything like feeling good, then you can add a little bit of something on top of it to, to get that style, that emotion, that feeling, the color. So usually I split tone when I think that um, someone's undertones are too aggressive. Right. Like the last thing I want to do is for the image to just be overpowering with a sense of orange. Or, right, right, right. Um, I'm, I'm pretty red. overpowering with a sense of blue and green. Well, it's not even that. It's just like, you know, sometimes you'll shoot something um, or on occasion you have two sources of light and the light balance doesn't feed right. And then you can really strip it so that it, the, the white is white. So you take that, that tinge of blue out. Um, and that's what I usually do on classic. But here, um, I would still give us, I would still. I mean, the, the photo looks great. Don't go me wrong. I'm not trying to no, 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 tell no, no, you to no, do no, more no. stuff to your photo. I'm just curious. I'm just saying, generally, I mean, yeah, yeah, no, it just depends on the image. I remember the biggest split tone I ever did was I shoot, shot a wedding and the bride was unhappy that her makeup made her look a little maybe more orange than she liked. So there was a lot of, Split toning. That was the first time I learned how to split tone. Nice. And I sat and figured that out. And it's, it's I mean, you guys know this other thing. You learn how to do stuff when you need to. Right. It's so a, the greatest amount of like growth and learning comes when you're just at a, at the wire and trying to figure oh, out how totally. do you make this stuff fix. And stuff turns around in a short period of time. Um, That's cool. So we got one. Let's do something. So I have. A, there was another question out there. What camera do you use on a regular basis? Um, I use a Mark II. Because I actually really like my Mark II. Canon and one, 5D Mark II? I have a Mark, Canon Mark II, 5D Mark II and a Canon 6D. And then I have that Fuji that I shoot for the train stuff. So yeah. I personally really love the DSLR feel because I used to shoot film SLRs. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, I, I just really like that. I like the feeling of it. I like having an optical viewfinder. 
um, setting my focus and just yeah, kind of. Today we're gonna have to fight again because I hate optical viewfinders. Today. Really? Oh my god, EVF Why? for the win. EVF for the win. Bro, your battery game is like rough. Oh my god, I have so many batteries, so many batteries. But uh, actually, one of the persons was asking, asking also, what resolution is what your I, camera? Oh, that's a good question. Like, I think the 5D Mark II was 24 megapixel, yeah, if I can't remember, if I remember correctly. It's been a little bit. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. I think that, that like, Josh the, is the, good, the good answer about that, what's nice about that is you don't care. And that's the right answer, because I think like, we got too fixated on the resolution game. Like it's amazing. Like oh yeah, it is. I just what does it matter? Like what do you? How do you use your pictures? Do you print so, them? So I mean, even I, I mean, one of my photos is printed on a yeah. wall over there. Yeah, and you didn't even think about your resolution because yeah. cameras today are so good that it, it basically, if you've got a camera in the last five or six years, yeah. you can print it really large, and it's amazing. I think we need to focus as as creatives on capturing that that moment. The decisive yeah. moment, capturing the emotion, capturing the motion, capturing the depth, capturing the, the feeling, just telling a story and not focusing so much on the technology behind it. Now, there's still fun technologies we can think okay, about yeah, and yeah. it's a lot of fun like and I get, points yeah, and things, yeah, I, get yeah. I get excited about that as much as the next one. I mean, one of the reasons we get these photographers is because we all love toys and there's a lot of toys in photography. You should see my bag full of toys, but at the same time, we should be less focused on the resolution, the camera, anything like that, more focused on capturing that emotion. So yeah, I mean, I always tell people when they ask me which camera to use, buy whatever camera. We need 100 pixel pixel. Yeah. You can get in close. I can just get closer if that's what you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I always tell people to go to Best Buy or go to yeah. Target or B&H or whatever and just play with all the cameras and see how it feels. I remember when I was, really young, um, I was in middle school, a lot of my friends got Nikon D40s, and I just didn't really like how the operating system was. And that, that was it, like it's something wrong or bad. You know, and that's, that's actually really important to think about is like what feels good yep. and what makes sense because in the end of the day, you want, the goal I think is for your camera to disappear. Yeah. You don't want to think about your camera. You want to think about your subject, the scene, the everything. And if you're thinking about your buttons and your stuff like that, you're not thinking about taking the photo. And that means like feeling something that feels comfortable and then practicing with it and getting really good at it. You need to be able to change your lens with one yeah. hand without looking, changing your batteries, so weird, changing yeah. all the settings. You need to be able to set your focus without, I, could, I can do all this stuff in the dark because I've been playing with my camera so much because that way, that's the only way I can actually capture images. Totally. There's another question. While we're, while we're talking, I'm just going to keep, I'm going to edit this no other worries, photo. No worries, please, please. So you guys so, can just so see. So Miles really, really wants to know, he's asked the question a couple of times, so apparently this is an important question to Miles. Miles, you can't keep on asking new questions, dude. I was just about to ask you one question, you ask another one. Man, where do you mostly take your pictures? Where do I take them? Well, I mean, it looks like from your, your stories. Project is everywhere. Everywhere, bro. right? So, so really quick, uh, let's go back. Okay, so as you guys can see, um, I actually put CineStyle on my camera, which is uh, something you use when you shoot, you know this, when you shoot um, for like motion, for stills, so that everything's flat. Yeah. So you'll see this is pretty gray. So the first thing is just making it more dynamic. So it's, he doesn't look like this. His hair is darker and it looks really pale here. Right. Um, and this is one of the few times I actually will personally up the saturation because I know yep. that this was a much more orange day. And Terry actually talked about this, Terry White, um, where, we have an inclination a lot of times to always white balance perfectly at zero or whatever right. it is. But like the bluer someone's skin is, the more exhausting it is and the more like kind of weird it is. So you do want to have them look a little warmer right. um, and give them a little bit of that spirit. Right. Um, so you can use that with the temp slider to yep. get a little warmth in there, the saturation. Yep. You know, he's got a little bit of that shadow on his forehead, yep. which makes the forehead part of it look a little bit bluer. You yeah. can even do that selectively if you wanted to. Oh no, totally. So you can bring it in here. You know, um, like bring a little bit of an eye, like brush onto his eye. Oh yeah, yeah. we're now we're gonna bring it up. Oh yeah, all so these things uh, we can do. You know, when you're doing headshots, as yeah. I'm sure you already know, you always want to make sure you go over the teeth and the eyes. Yeah, but be careful. You don't want to go too far because oh, then no, they no, look no, like no. the Exorcist. Not super far, but I'm yes. just saying you want to make them look a little younger and a little happier. Um, so you know, we have this here. We'll break this, sharp this down because we don't need that. Um, and we want to selectively. And I mean, yes, this is Karen, just dodge we also and love Terry White. I think we can both say we love Terry White. He's a, a great, great person here at Adobe. And Terry said it, and he's right. So you guys can see how this is filling up, and it's just giving him a little spirit right. around his eyes. Um, and especially when you have light colored eyes, it looks good because it pops out. Yep. And you know, you can use the O key to hide some of those things. Like if you have the, the, the mouse cursor over there. Yeah. Oh, you want to go back to it? No, you can. I mean, they're just showing you. like. You have uh, the O key, we'll show you the brush that you have on there, and the O key will hide it again. Nice. 
Oh. It'll do it now, like, yeah, there you go. Cool. Uh, so we got only like five more minutes. Yeah. So let's see what, what's important to, to wrap up. Um, yeah, because like, I think that uh, we've got a couple of other shows coming up. But, but one thing that's important, you recently did a, uh, a little segment for my show over oh, at Photoville, yeah. which will be coming out pretty soon. So if so, you guys tell Josh that you like it, I can be back on the show. But yeah. he's trying to get me off the show? No, I never would do that. I want you definitely on the show. But you guys should check out uh, soon. I don't know the date where Andre will be on my show. I've got a show on YouTube. If you check out the Lightroom channel on YouTube for uh, the Make It Photography yeah. show. It's um, like you, you Andre will be. Oh, yeah, of course. I'm getting there. I'm getting there, buddy. But we're going to have Andre on there. He's going to do a little thing at Photoville, which was an event at, at New York City, which is really cool. Um, and you have to see him walking around talking about it, uh, which is great. And hopefully we will have you on the show uh, to talk about your photography great. and talk more about your creative process. I'm just trying to interview you. Oh, really? Well, you we're can do that. Inverse. We can flip it around. We can just we can flip it around. It's all good. Put him on because he's funny. Yes, Andre thank is you, funny. Miles. Miles, thank you very much. How do you much. get a blue check on this? I think you have to be special. I got Tim, to tighten Tim up. Is special. I don't even have a blue check. What's up, Tim? Tim is Tim is special. Um, he's he's a he's blue check Tim. That's what we call him. So we're talking about work. You guys asked me a little bit of it. Um, I since I was a journalism major in college, we were like not really we were allowed to, but we weren't really big Photoshop people. We weren't really allowed to do much besides like dodge and burn and well, that's photojournalism for stuff. you. So I would just say that. Um, I always learn, just try to get it right when you shoot it the first time. Not the first time, but just before you get into Photoshop like it, or Lightroom. Not because it's bad or good, right. but just because you'll always be better off than if your photo is too dark, especially if it's too light, because then you're kind of in a bad spot. Right. But um, I would just tell people that. Like, I knew that I wanted John here. Um, I wanted this effect of shooting him through these, so yeah, I backlit him, but then you got to get all this cool color on the flowers, and it cool. kind of softened them up and made him look kind of cool and calm. Right. So yeah, I would just say that you always want to get it, try to get it that first time, and then batch shoot so you can batch edit. Um, you don't want to be bracketing like crazy and then editing. You're spending, making a lot more work for yourself. Right. Um, the well, I think thing, that the idea of getting it right in camera is important. The other thing about that, though, is it, just thinking about it, thinking through it, because what you don't want to do is you don't want to have just thought about, all right, I'll fix it later, and then you get back and you realize, well, shoot, it's not in focus, uh -huh. I have this big uh -huh. thing coming out of the person's back of their head. It's all about being present in taking the photo. Yeah. I think that's really important, and I, I like to tell people that are getting into photography, check your corners, check your edges, make sure that you have nothing intersecting with the edges, you don't have the eye being dragged away. You want to make sure that that story yeah. of the subject is the thing that's standing out, and that means check your edges all the time. Yeah. There's a, um, my mom gave me this book when I was like, probably in middle school about photography, it was like a Kodak book, mm -hmm. and it said that a lens is designed to be like an eye, but unlike an eye, where I can look at something and determine the importance when I stare at it, a lens can take, gives everything equal importance. Right. So it's our job, as and us, and creatives, and illustrators, and images, and all um, the people out around the world. To make that importance with color, with light, with cropping, with whatever, and he said it. Check your corners, man. Like, imagine if there was like a blimp in this corner or something. Right. It just it would drag you away from it. Oh, and your I always goes to the brightest part of the image. Yeah. Well, what's interesting, I read about this recently that there's actually some uh, people have done some studies that show that while we get distracted by bright objects, we actually that that is an old rule that we've been thinking about. And there's new data that shows when you show people pictures, they've done a lot of heat maps and tracking people's eyeballs using all that science and technology goodness. All the science. And, yeah, and they actually found that that the thing that I was brought up to learn, which is what you just said, people's eyes go to the most bright thing people actually go to the subject and we're able to actually overcome that problem. So things like a face or text, the eye will be drawn to that more. Not to say that a bright object in the wrong place would cause distractions, but you've got in this image, you can even look on your image what you're looking right now, you've got this really bright area right at the top and we're still looking at the face. Yep. And so there is some truth to that. So it's, it's important to balance these elements like about like bright objects distracting away from the subject. But I think more importantly than anything else is make sure that the subject is obvious and it's clear. And we're getting the wrap it up B, uh, Got a little Dave Chappelle um, okay, action going on with a little thing in the background. I love Dave Chappelle, so I fully support that on the show. <laughs> um, yes, last thing, um, I guess as we leave, Josh, who is a photographer you're excited about right now? You. Wow, that's shoot, that seemed like I was being. I'm sorry. I guess we have to leave now. <laughs> <laughs> I really made no. I didn't mean that. <laughs> Just, I'm sorry.
sorry. Yeah. It's nice to meet everybody. I'm yeah. gonna just go hide now. Yeah, we're gonna, so the next show that's coming up is gonna be live with a video maker, guest Emily Ann Hoffman. Our Ooh, host is gonna be Rufus. Oh. And we're gonna be doing with Premiere Pro. It's starting at noon, so make sure you stick around for that one. Uh, it was great talking to you, Andre. Really, really appreciate it. You're awesome. <laughs> it was like, you guys are done. What, it said I had...